Glovebox Live's Nick John interviews Eliza Carthy. Welcome everybody to another Glovebox Live interview and tonight we're at Gloucester Guildhall and it's fantastic to be talking to the amazing Eliza Carthy. Hi Eliza, welcome. Thank you. <laughs> so, um, am I right in thinking that this is the first full tour with the Wayward Band? It's not the first full tour, no, it's the first full tour with the new material. Right. Um, we did our very first full tour was in 2013. Uh, which was to promote the Wayward Daughter boxed set. Yeah. And um, we did new arrangements of the material on, on that, which was a double CD, um, best of compilation. Um, then we started writing new material about two years ago, and uh, we, we got a, a patron um, in Gloucestershire, actually. We got, we got, we got a patron in Gloucestershire who, who offered us the the chance to to make an album and we jumped at it because we didn't think that we would ever get the chance to do that was that because you were just aware that it's everybody has different things everybody's got something else. Was it, no was no it's it just extremely to expensive yeah okay. <laughs> yeah an album uh, making an album the more people you have yeah. on it the more expensive it's going to be yes. yeah <laughs> and also you know the bigger the venue you have to do it in and all of that kind of stuff so we had to go to real world studios and we went to Rockfield as well in Wales. Um, and they're, they're residential places, you know, and, and uh, yeah, you have to, it's a bit of a military operation, really, recording an album of that size. So, so once um, you knew you wanted to do it, yeah. this is Big Machine, of course, Yeah. Uh, did you then have to kind of plan it, yeah. as you say? So yeah, very much so. And and avail- availability's got to be difficult with people. Availabilities are always difficult. Yeah, we had, uh, we had six weeks all together, and we, um, we did it in blocks. We did the first part of the album, basically the bulk of every track was done as live in Real World Studios. Um, And then we added things like the strings and the brass afterwards. Yeah. Um, So, uh, but this was the first time that I myself had employed an outside producer as well. And I got uh, a fellow called Jim Sutherland, who is a a percussionist, um, drummer and producer from Scotland. that was responsible for really the album that changed my life was an album by Sugar Nifty called Venus in Tweeds. Uh, it came out in about 1994 and it was the first time I'd really heard modern production applied to traditional music. And he also has a 37 piece band, so I thought he would be able to, <laughs> I thought he could handle 12, you know. Yeah, this is nothing. <laughs> but you need, uh, it, it, you know, when, when you're that close to it, you actually need somebody with an outside organisational mind really to to help you put all of that together. And I was, uh, yeah, I was very, very glad well, that's what they say, isn't it, about to work with him. A, a, a good producer will yeah. will help you sift through what there is. And, and with, Absolutely. I mean, there, there must be, I was going to ask you about, for the album, um, the arrangements. Mm. Um, you know, do, do when you were writing the songs or taking the traditional songs and, and doing the arrangements with the band, did you come up with those arrangements and say to the guys, I want you to do this? Or did you kind of all get into a room and jam in the traditional sense? How, well, how, how it, does that process work? It happens in lots of different ways, actually. Um, again, there are 12 people in the band, plus the producer being 13th mind. That happened in lots of different ways. Sometimes we sat around and jammed things out. We did a, a week's worth of rehearsing at this village hall in uh, just outside Robin Hood's Bay. And uh, we put a lot of stuff together in that. Uh, in that format and we got back to the house we were having we were all cooking and and, uh, having dinner and stuff and we're thinking what don't we have we haven't got a jig you know and I was I had loads of um, I had loads of notes and things from um, from Cheatham's library in Manchester where I'd made a program for BBC Radio 4 um, about the broadside ballad collections that they have there and I still had a couple of them kicking around. The thing about broadside ballads is they don't ha- tend to have tunes to them. So I got a couple out and I found Devil and the Woman and I got, and I got that out and um, handed it to Lucy. And Lucy came up with the tune for that and we all sat around in the kitchen um, playing the rhythm because we didn't have our instruments with us. They were back at the village hall. So that's how that one started out. But then something like Mrs. Dyer, the baby farmer, for instance, I, 
I wrote and demoed that arrangement probably 10, 15 years ago. Um, and so that was just a question of getting it out onto the larger palette of the band, whereas I'd done like a fiddle and a viola and a couple of drum parts for it. Then it was a question of getting it out um, and spreading it out across the, across the musicians. So um, yeah, there were lots of different ways. We had some tune sets that we presented to Jim and he was like, yeah, 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 tune sets, you know, that's great. But how about we do it like this? And we chop them up and you get rid of that section and we have a guitar solo here and we do this and this. So there were some things where he, where he uh, basically treated us as a jigsaw, cut all the bits up and then put it back together in a different way. Love not, love not you hopeless sons of clay Hope's gayest wreaths are made of early flowers And things are made to fade and fall away When they have blossomed but a few short hours Your early albums in the 90s that you were, there was a sort of aiming at a sort of folk pop crossover, and you then went back to the more traditional stuff, just yourself almost on the albums. And did you get to dreams of breathing underwater? Was there a sort of point where you went, okay, I'm just going to go for it now? I don't think I've ever played traditional music any differently. I don't think there was ever a moment where, I mean, it, it, you could very fairly say that the, the Wayward Band is folk pop as well. It's more folk rock, really. It's, it's, I've, I've never seen it as a process of fusion. I've always seen it as this is how a modern person plays traditional music okay. because I don't think it's possible or desirable to, to put a bucket over your head and pretend that you can't hear what the rest, what's going on in the rest of the world. You know, I, I think it's somehow, I think it's a little bit unnatural to do that when it comes to traditional music. But there are people like I don't know that. what these songs sounded like 200 years ago. They certainly didn't have guitars and violins on them, you know. So it's like, you know, what, yes. what people think yeah. of now as traditional music, like, like Melodians, for instance. Melodians didn't come along until like 150 years ago. So they're, they're, they're not traditional instruments either. So just trying to construct this false idol really doesn't make any sense to me. And I... You know, in the 90s, I was hanging out with... I was still hanging out with Barn. That's my bass player. In the 90s, I was hanging out with Barn, and he was a reggae bass player. So when we played together, that's what we played. You know, um, we, you know, I came with the traditional songs, and he came with his influences, and we put them together, and that was just... So uh, there was no real thought that you were doing something radical that was going to upset all the folk clubs? <laughs> no, I didn't like think that. so, although it was a, it was a conscious decision to to uh, not remove myself from folk club stages because I never did that. I've always performed on folk club stages with my parents and with smaller lineups. But I always wanted, I wanted an overarching, overreaching vision for, for traditional music to put it on a wider stage. To, because I, I, I always thought the only problem with traditional music uh, was lack of access with people. So, like, oh, oh yeah, they knew what Irish music was, or, you know, they knew what Celtic music was, or they knew what African music was, or whatever. But they didn't. But they didn't know that the English had a traditional music, or what it's, or what it could possibly sound like. So that was a very, very much a conscious effort on my part. I had long and involved conversations with Topic Records about that, and with about the marketing of the albums, how they should be presented. Um, that I thought it would be a good idea to get promo companies involved and things like that. And this is back in 1994, 95, you know. Um, Because it's all very well posing on a hill with a violin, looking all wafty, you know. But that's... I I didn't feel that the folk scene needed me to do that. I felt that I would be better placed, not as an ambassador, but as as someone that was willing to put my neck out. And it's not always been successful by any means, but uh, I always thought it was important to try. Sometimes we're quiet because we want to listen Or because there's so much we want to say The heavens and hells in us drive all... You write socially conscious lyrics, you, you look for things in traditional song that resonate today. I just wondered with, with the state we're in. 
at the moment hard. whether you've gone like, I, I ah. believe I believe it's extraordinarily hard to be proud of being English at the moment. I, I think we're making a dreadful mess of of our society and you know, our country. And um, I I never thought if you know 10, 15 years ago if you'd have asked me that we'd be here now in the state that we're in in the xenophobic kind of fearful austerity fearful is the thing really the, the 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 amount of fear kicking around the amount of fear of other people fear of other cultures fear of what's going to happen to us and how our society has allowed that to happen to us through the various governments that we've that we've put <laughs> to rule us um i <clears throat> i i wouldn't have believed it I, because i uh, you know, I was a nice, nice liberal child and I just thought that, that everything was going to get better. Everything was always going to get better. Humanity was always going to evolve. And it seems to me like we've, we've, we've backtracked really back to the Victorian era. I, I really feel that we, are, that we are allowing all of the things that we, that we invented to take care of ourselves. <laughs> we are allowing all of those things to be taken away. But I still think it's important to be a part of the counter-argument to that, to be part of the Englishness that celebrates protest and not believing what we're sold, what we're told, because there's all kinds of agendas out there that, that um, don't have our best interest at heart. And the, the English do have a long and proud history of uh, protest, you know, and I think it's important that we that we celebrate that and that we recognise that these dreadful times will not be around here forever if we are careful and loving and generous and hold our arms open and, uh, and, and educate ourselves to the best of our abilities, even though that is also becoming harder. Mm. And we're allowing, we're allowing people to tell us that education is bad. We're allowing people to tell us that knowledge is elitism which is one, one of the most disgraceful things I think I've ever heard in my life. I just, uh, that is how ordinary people elevate themselves through, through knowledge and through self-education. If, if, the, if the government won't give it to you, you find it for yourself. You know, that's what English people do in my, in my mind and in our history. I feel that's what we do. And we do take people in. For instance, I've been working in Hull all year and um, working for Hull City of Culture 2017 and Hull was a massive Brexit town and they didn't know well a lot of people didn't know that Hull had a huge I mean aside from the aside from the anti-slavery movement the William Wilberforce history and all of that kind of stuff Hull took in something like 40 Spanish refugee children after the civil war after the civil war you know things like that Hull had huge German populations Italians Irish Polish you know, like any port town does. Yes. Yeah. And people forget that. They're like, oh, all these people flooding in here. And it's like, I'm sorry, have you looked at your next door neighbour recently who has been your next door neighbour for the last 300 years? Because no one is pure. And this, this idea that we, we're being made to fear, we're being made to fear some imaginary influx of people who are actually helping us because we are making a mess of things. I think the English are better than that. And I think we need to be reminded, I think we need to remind ourselves that we are better than that. It'll be interesting to see what the songs now, that are being written now, how they'll be viewed in a hundred years' time, when yeah. they're being performed <laughs> in a hundred years, in two hundred years. We won't know, but it'll, yeah. I'll yeah, be very interested to see the way history yeah. pro uh, portrays this time in our lives. I, I might, you know, I wouldn't be, wouldn't be surprised if it was seen as another Dark Ages well, thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Sorry to end uh, on a down note. No, no, I'm going to ask you one last question, which isn't a down note. Uh, as a child of Scarborough myself, no. which is better, North Bay or South Bay? <laughs> I'm not getting involved okay. in that. <laughs> thank you, Eliza. Thank you very much for talking to us. Thank you very much. <laughs>